My name is Melanie Stevenson, and the talk that I'm going to present is called The Hatton Gallery Will Be the Scene of an Experiment. I had the privilege between 2015 and 2020 of undertaking a PhD in fine art and art history at Newcastle University in collaboration with the Hatton Gallery, which is situated in the university's fine art building and is managed by Tyne Weir Archives and Museums on the university's behalf. My research, which was part of a project considering art education and culture in the Northeast from the 1930s to the 1970s, was initially undertaken with the aim of understanding the role of the Hatton Gallery art collection played as a teaching collection in the 1950s and 1960s. However, I went on to focus more specifically on the origin, rationale and role of that part of the collection created by Lawrence Gowing to cut the post of Professor of Fine Art and Director of the Art School at King's College, University of Durham, now Newcastle University, in 1948. I considered how the history, ethos and environment of the art school, together with the ambitions of Lawrence Gowing as an artist and educator, culminated in the formation of a significant collection of artworks during his time at King's College in the 1950s. Subsequently, I was fortunate to be awarded a scholarly research grant from the Association for Art History, which helped continue my research, in which I concentrated on two of Gowing's early projects in the Hatton Gallery. So this talk draws on some of the propositions I explore in my thesis and in my ongoing research about what might have motivated Gowing to form this art collection. I will also consider how Gowing established the Hatton Gallery as a space where experimental ideas about exhibiting, making and teaching art could be tested out. I will do this by explaining how these two projects that Gowing embarked upon early in his career as Professor of Fine Art distinctly bear the stamp of his multiple interests, art curating, scholarship, connoisseurship, art education, and sharing his passion and enthusiasm for art with others. These projects were two exhibitions which took place in the Hatton Gallery during 1951 and 1952. The first was the exhibition pictures from collections in Northumberland in May to June 1951, the cover of the catalogue of which is shown on the left of this slide. The second was the two-part exhibition, which ran from November 1951 to March 1952, focused on a series of artworks depicting the seven sacraments by the 17th century Rome-trained French artist Nicolas Poussin and the cover of the catalogue is on the right of this image. I will consider how the exhibition, Pictures from Collections in Northumberland, may have acted as a prelude to Gowing's creation of an art collection for the Hatton Gallery, which began to take shape from 1952, and by the time of his departure in 1958, had formed into a significant collection of old master and contemporary works. And these included, among many others, the works shown here in an exhibition of the collection in 2019. In this slide, there are works after the 16th century Flemish artist Hugo van der Hoes and the 17th century Italian artists Domenichino and Salvatore Rosa. In this next slide, there's an early 17th century work by the Italian artist Camillo Procaccini a work by a British artist, William Roberts, from the 1950s, and one by another British artist, John Hamilton Mortimer, from the 18th century. I will also propose how the second two-part exhibition on Poussin's series of paintings, The Seven Sacraments, sets the scene for the Hatton Gallery as a place of experiment later in the decade, when it became the testing ground for the innovative exhibition formats, art making and teaching of artists Richard Hamilton and Victor Passmore, who Gowing brought to Newcastle to teach in the department from 1952. Hamilton's exhibition, Man, Machine in Motion of 1955, and Hamilton and Passmore's installation work called An Exhibit of 1957, which were both created in the Hatton Gallery, together with their experimental teaching of art practice, known as the basic, basic course, 
are much better recognized, researched and acknowledged. But I propose that they did not come out of a vacuum for Going had already been using the Hatton Gallery to experiment with his own ideas about art practice and art teaching before they arrived. And this slide shows at the top Hamilton's exhibition, Man, Machine and Motion of 1955, which documented through images, mankind's quest for speed and its determination to overcome or imitate nature through the power of machines. Below is Hamilton standing with Passmore to his right in their installation and exhibit 1957, in which they filled the gallery with suspended horizontal and vertical perspex panels through which the visitor had to decide their own route and hence their own unique experience of the exhibition. I also hope that my talk will draw attention to the value and significance of the Hatton Gallery art collection, as well as the value and reward in researching exhibition history and the importance of the Hatton Gallery archive as a resource for research in the field of art history and art scholarship. And so, taking a cue from a phrase that Gowing himself used in describing the Poussin exhibitions, I have called this talk, The Hatton Gallery will be, will be the scene of an experiment. But first to provide some context and set the scene for the two exhibitions that I'm going to discuss. Lawrence Gowing moved from London to Newcastle in the spring term of 1948 to take up the Chair of Fine Art and Directorship of the Fine Art Department of King's College. At the age of 30, he was remarkably young at that time to become a professor. His previous experience was as, as a tutor at Camberwell School of Art in London during the late war years, having undertaken his own art training at the Euston Road School under artist Victor, pa Victor Pasmore and William Coldstream. He took over the position at Newcastle from Robin Darwin, who had briefly run the fine art department from 1946, again after no experience of running a higher education art institution, but who soon left Newcastle to return to London to restructure the Royal College of Art into a world-class, world-renowned postgraduate fine art and design school. Gowing had, in fact, applied for the Newcastle post after chance meeting with Darwin on a London bus taking up the opportunity, as he was later to explain, to run an art school to my liking. So it was somewhere where he could test out his own ideas on art history, art teaching and art practice. And this image is of Gowing in his studio in the Fine Art Department in 1957. The environment which Gowing left London for and traveled north to However, was not unused to experiment and innovation. By 1948, the art school could look back over more than a hundred year history. It had, had, it had transitioned from the art class of a Northeast Art Society through a government branch school of design into the art school of the Durham College of Science and then Armstrong College, the Newcastle division of Durham University with his own professor of fine art, the first of whom was Richard Hatton in whose honour the College Gallery was renamed after his death in 1926. Three years earlier, in 1923, in recognition of the substantial work that Hatton, his colleagues and predecessors had undertaken in establishing the art school in the academic life of the university and in underpinning its disciplines with levels of research and scholarship worthy of degree status, the University Senate had adopted fine art and architecture as major subjects in the Honours Bachelor of Arts degree course. As a result, in 1927, sadly a year too late for Hatton to experience, Durham became the first English university to award an honours degree in fine art for a course in which art practice and art history was taught as an integrated subject. And the successful candidate was a woman called Ethel Urquhart. And so by the time Gowing arrived at the art school, it was a Durham University department running degree awarding courses in painting, sculpture and design with a considerable level of autonomy and prestige. From the early 1950s, Richard Gowing and his colleagues at the art school curated ambitious exhibitions as part of the program for the Hatton Gallery which at that time consisted of just the one classical columned room. 
And this image from the 1950s shows a view of the Hatton Gallery from the King's College quadrangle, with the Hatton Gallery on the left of the picture, adjoining the fine art building with its landmark arches. The art school and its rather beautiful little gallery, as Guy was to describe it in 1952, provided a testing ground for the ideas that Gowing had been developing about painting, and particularly the value of the old masters to contemporary art practice. In his anonymous series of essays from a painter's notebook, published in the Penguin New Writing series from 1945 to 1947. These essays provided a fascinating insight into the emerging cultural landscape of early post-war Britain from the perspective of an artist trying to make sense of it for his own practice and that of his peers and for contemporary society. And this image shows some of the Penguin New Writing series in which Gowing's essay essays featured. Gowing was particularly critical of much contemporary writing on art, which he felt demonstrated a lack of understanding about the nature of creativity and how the artists engaged with their own creative compulsions, their subject matter, and the society in which they lived. He argued that if books were to be written on painting, they should be of the kind which will point out just how lively the past is as a productive force, and which would set the student's head on fire and to make the interested amateur more interested still. The lack of such books, as he saw it, motivated Gowing to venture into his own writing on art and artists. His resulting book on the Dutch 17th century artist Vermeer, completed after his move to Newcastle, was to become a highly respected scholarly work and one of many that he went on to produce on a wide range of artists. There was, however, one group of writers on art who Gowing did hold in high esteem and to which he no doubt aspired. These were the interdisciplinary scholars of the Warburg Institute, who as Gowing perceived them, were devoted to muddle. According to Gowing, their scholarship published in the Warburg Journal unraveled the artworks, classical, religious, social, medical, and anthropological references, and reconstructed the whole world of half conscious preoccupations which found their way relevantly or irrelevantly into the canvases on which these scholars engage their studies. And this image shows an aspect of the work for which the founder of the Institute, Abby Warburg, is renowned. A panel from his project, the Mimosine Atlas, in which Warburg worked with images to explore how ancient and classical ideas persisted into the Renaissance period and beyond. Going was also concerned about how so much art for so many people was only being experienced through what he described as gentle, velvet and seductive reproductions. This was especially significant because the war years had removed the opportunity to see most original artworks, and he wrote evocatively about his own experience of the return of paintings to the National Gallery at the end of World War II. Gowick saw the art of the past as providing richness and complexity, and the original artwork as holding within it the whole history of its production society's perception, interpretation and use of it. This could not be captured or experienced through reproductions and Gowen believed passionately that whether it was with reverence or revulsion, it was vital for people to be able to experience original artworks for themselves. Having the Hatton Gallery to hand a few steps across the art department's hall from his office must have fired Gowing's imagination for its potential not just as a host for touring shows, but as a space where he could personally curate exhibitions to show the good painting of the old and modern masters and facilitate for others his own experience of what he described as the raw indigestible personal utterance when confronted by an original artwork. So far distant from the London galleries and museums, and in the absence of the type of art books with which he would have wanted to stock the art school library, the Hatton Gallery at least provided an empty canvas. On its walls, Gowen could experiment in sharing his own curiosity, wonder and passion for art 
with those from the university and the region who came through its doors. He would also no doubt have seen it as a means of whetting his constant appetite for studying art when he was so distant during term time from the London, from the London art scene. While perhaps also intentionally drawing the gaze of London's art world northwards to remind them of his presence and his purpose. One available means of making artworks accessible to the students was by bringing ready-made collections from the likes of the Arts Council and the v &A to the Hatton Gallery, which was an amenity both for the university and the city. Gowing's predecessor, Robin Darwin, had developed a substantial exhibition programme, but this did not come to full fruition during his short time in the Northeast. Gowing, however, took up the baton with a vengeance, improving the gallery lighting and introducing a new programme supported by his abundant ambition, energy and access to departmental funds of £30 per exhibition, a current value of around £1,000. From January 1949, new exhibitions took place on an almost monthly basis, clearly bearing the stamp of Gowing's own preoccupations traced back to his From a Painter's Notebook essays. And this next slide shows examples of some of the exhibitions that took place in the first couple of years of the programme. There are exhibitions of Constable, collections of Dutch, British and European old masters, interspersed by contemporary artists such as Picasso and Clay and his own painting tutor, Victor Pasmore. Gowing's ambitions for the Hatton Gallery were somewhat diverted by his absence from the department to undergo treatment for TB during 1949 and early 1950. He may have been absent and recuperating, but he was not resting, as he used the time to complete his book on Vermeer, which was published in 1952 and established his reputation as a scholar, an accomplishment recognized by the university. And this image shows a still from a film promoting King's College in 1953, in which Gowing's book clearly appear, appears as an example of the college's vital work in research and creative thinking. En route to publishing this book, Gowing's research may also have helped him develop the networks which supported his subsequent curating and collecting career at Newcastle. From the end of March 1950, Gowing was back in the department and with the Master of Painting, Roger de Grey, and the department's Courtauld trained art historian, Rafe Holland, he was developing an exhibition with the city of Newcastle for the Festival of Britain. Gowing gained the financial support of the Arts Council of Great Britain to cover the additional costs incurred above what would normally have been spent on the departmental grant. He proposed an exhibition that would bring out from and showcase the European masterpieces of Northumberland's country houses and castles. For Gowing, this entailed putting a call out in the local papers, and as he explained in a letter to Kenneth Clark in April 1951, ferreting about in Northumberland country houses. Gowing surveyed 15 collections, engaging with their owners, including various peers of the realm and persuading them to loan their works. He called on the expert assistance of the director of the Scottish National Gallery, Ellis Kirk and Waterhouse, to advise on his selection and produce the information for the catalogue, which Rafe Holland then compiled. This image shows Holland in his office in the Fine Art Department, alongside some of the text of the forward of the catalogue. Gowing also engaged the expertise of Dr. Leopold Ettlinger and Ernst Gombrich from his revered Warburg Institute, and Graham Reynolds, keeper of the Department of Prints at the V&A. Gowing's correspondence to Waterhouse in the Hatton Gallery archive, detailing his finds and musings on the contents of numerous halls, houses and castles, in itself provides a fascinating snapshot of the content and state of these Northumberland collections in the early post-war period. Another auspicious and timely factor in supporting Gowing's ambitions, which should not be overlooked or underestimated, was the support and patronage of the Rector of King's College, Lord Eustace Percy. And Gowing's portrait of Percy is in Newcastle University's art collection, 
and hangs in the King in Newcastle University's King's Hall. Percy was well connected with the role of arts in education and with the wealthy country house owners of Northumberland and elsewhere. He had held prominent government roles, including as president of the Board of Education in the 1920s. He was also a son of the seventh Duke of Northumberland, uncle of the incumbent 10th Duke, New Algernon Percy, and the uncle-in-law of the Earl of Ellesmere. Percy was very well situated to open doors for Gowing, introducing and advocating Gowing to his family connections as an eminently efficient and reliable person and the Hatton Gallery as a suitable venue for the proposed project. It would seem that many stars were lining up at this specific time in this Northern Provincial University College to portend a bright future for art scholarship, for art collecting and art teaching, not only for the art school, but also for the Northumberland estates and the wider art collecting world. The aim of the pictures from collections in Northumberland exhibition was explained by Waterhouse in his review of this and other similar exhibitions for the Burlington Magazine in August 1951. These exhibitions aimed to provide an anthology from local collections in the county in whose capital the exhibition was held. Waterhouse pointed out that Gowing's exhibition of works from the Northeast country houses was a novel enterprise, an experiment it could be argued bringing together works from collections which were relatively unknown. Many of the works were attributed old masters, some of which had not been seen outside of their drawing rooms, libraries, or uninhabited, unha uninhabited parts of their castles on view for the first time to the college students and the public alike. Some, with Gowing's ensuing interventions, were to gain attributions of significance to their owners, to art scholarship, and to international collections. Gowing selected 44 paintings for the exhibition, ranging across religious works, portraits, and landscapes by artists including Rembrandt, Canaletto, Annibale Caracci, Van Gogh, Habima, Gainsborough, and Claude Lorraine. In this talk, I will indicate the influence and significance of this exhibition to the art world by focusing on just a few of the works which were displayed though there are many others with stories to tell and further research to be done. I'll also suggest how, at the same time, this exhibition may have inspired and motivated Gowing's desire to form an art collection for the university and for the art school. In his review of the exhibition in the Burlington magazine, Ellis Walsallhouse concentrated on the additions to knowledge that the exhibition had produced. First, bringing to the reader's notice what he described as the Duke of Northumberland's Riminese Primitive, which had hitherto escaped publication. And this image shows the work and its description as it appears in the catalogue. In the exhibition catalogue, it is featured with a photograph and described as a panel with five scenes from a composite alt altarpiece by a Riminese follower of Giotto. Its accompanying description refers to a companion panel which seemed to come from the same altarpiece, which was in the Palazzo Venezia Museum in Rome. The exhibition catalogue explains how it, that it probably came into the Percy family's Annick collection from the 1851 sale of works from the Camuccini collection. Camuccini being an Italian artist who had amassed his own fine collection of artworks in the early part of the 19th century. Correspondence from Gowing to the Duke of Northumberland shows that on Waterhouse's advice, Gowing pursued, persuaded the Duke to loan it as the most important primitive painting in Northumberland and of a kind not yet represented in the exhibition. It was a painting at that time labeled in the Duke's collection as a giotto and hanging in his public rooms. By the time Waterhouse wrote his Burlington magazine review, he had, however, confirmed it as the missing companion piece to that in the Museo di Palazzo Venezia in Rome and attributed to the 14th century master Giovanni della Rimini. For reasons as yet undiscovered, the Riminese panel could not be returned to Annick at the end of the exhibition and remained in the fine art department insured for £4,000, where it may have hung in the department's corridors, 
staff offices, the library, and from time to time, the Hatton Gallery. Having been brought to light for the remainder of the 1950s, the panel depicting scenes from the lives of the Virgin, St. John the Evangelist, St. Catherine of Alexandria, St. Francis and St. John the Baptist, was referenced and re reproduced in numerous papers on sco by scholars on 14th century Riminese works. It is not clear when it was no longer in the department, but in 1953, Gowing purchased his own 14th century primitive painting from Sotheby's, perhaps as a replacement to hang in the Hatton Gallery. And this is the image of that purchase. This is the polyptych of four saints St. Francis and John the Baptist, St. Bartholomew and St. John the Evangelist, attributed at that time to Bernardo Daddi, but later reattributed to the school of Giovanni del Biondo. In July 2014, the Annick Rimini panel was on sale at Sotheby's by order of the 12th Duke of Northumberland and the trustees of the Northumberland Estates. Described as an extremely rare work by Giovanni de Rimini, 1300 to 1305, and one of the very earliest paintings to be offered at auction. It was sold for more than five million pounds in 2015, acquired by the National Gallery with a generous donation from New York philanthropist and collector Ronald S. Lauder. A press release on the National Gallery's website from 2017 describes the work as an exquisite late medieval painting and explains that it would reside with Mr. Lauder during his lifetime, but be displayed at regular intervals in the National Gallery. And this is the painting as shown on the National Gallery website. Going did not only curate the selection of works, he also cared for them, undertaking cleaning and restoration on some before deciding on their final selection. In April 1951, Going wrote to the Duke of Northumberland describing the first aid work he had undertaken on an allegorical scene and how his endeavors had resulted in the painting emerging as a much better one than expected. Going had sought Ernst Gombrich's opinion, who had asserted that he believed it to be by Giulio Romano. Going qualified that with the suggestion that it might at least be by one of his immediate circle and a work of considerable importance. Any doubts about its attribution were, however, dispelled by its listing in the exhibition catalogue as by Romano. It too remained, like the Riminese panel, in the department beyond the exhibition. But by 1962, it was with the art dealers Thomas Agnews and Sons. Since 1968, Romano's An Allegory of Immortality, as shown in this next image, has been in the Detroit Institute of Art in the USA, accompanied by numerous published references following on from its text in the exhibition catalogue and its mention in Waterhouse's Burlington Magazine Review. Another work which was brought to light, probably literally as well as metaphorically, from its scenes and unoccupied Swinburne Castle, was what Gowing described to Waterhouse as a wonderful Reynolds full length of Elizabeth Riddell, very influenced by Gainsborough and very beautiful. And this is the image of Mrs. Riddell as it appears in the exhibition catalogue. This work had not been seen in public since 1880, so the opportunity to research its records must have been very satisfying to Waterhouse, a Reynolds expert, as he was able to assign it a date of 1763 which was not available from Reynolds' Missing Sitters books, thereby providing a splendid addition to the knowledge of the artist's work. Waterhouse also described it as being in lovely condition, something that may be attributed to Gowing's interventions in doing some minor preservation work and removing some heavy pencil scribbling on the dress. Gowing advised its owner about his precarious condition, which might be exacerbated by its return to its home. The owner was obviously convinced by this argument as the portrait was still hanging in the Hatton Gallery in December 1958, along with the Riminese panel, the Romano Allegory, and some several other work, significant works which did not return to their original homes at the end of the exhibition. In 1965, the painting was brought from its, bought from its owner 
by the Newcastle Laying Art Gallery, where it is on view today to the public in all its beautiful but faded glory. Gowing would have been very pleased that his project generated so much ongoing scholarship and that his interventions had such far-reaching consequences. Subsequent sales of reattributed works in the exhibition meant that some, which were first on view to the art students and the North East Hatton Gallery going public, went on to become accessible to the global gallery going public at the National Gallery in London and other collections around the world. Not only that, but the money raised by the lenders on their later sales may have supported some of them to continue to maintain their estates and their remaining treasures for themselves and for public view for posterity. And Guy may well have been fired up by his experience of curating this exhibition and already anticipating the empty walls of the Hatton Gallery once the exhibition closed before it was even opened. At the end of January 1951, Lord Eustace Percy responded to a letter from Gowing with a memo which said, I certainly won't forget about the dream of the art collection. I am grateful to you for your particulars, but at the moment I can only promise to keep on my thinking cap. This thinking cap, along with Gowing's persistence and ambition, proved productive. In 1952, with access to a substantial sum of money held in the college's Shipley bequest, and to a growing network of art scholars, connoisseurs, collectors and dealers, Gowing purchased his first four artworks. And these were Soldiers in a Rocky Gorge by the 17th century Naples born artist Salvatore Rosa on the left of the slide. And the mid 16th century Pieta attributed to the Bolognese painter Lorenzo Sabatini on the right side of the slide. And in the next slide, an 18th, sorry, a 16th century portrait of a collector at that time attributed to Bologna and Rome trained artist Pellegrino Tibaldi, but now attributed to Bartolomeo Pasarotti. And on the right, a late 16th century painting of St. Mark by the Venetia pa Venetian painter Jacopo Palma Il Giovanni. And please note that these images are not to scale. By the time Gowing left Newcastle six years later, at the end of 1958, the Hatton Gallery had its own permanent collection of over 20 significant paintings and drawings, ranging from the 14th century to the 20th century, creating a precedent for the future art collecting with the art within the art department and a substantial legacy for the art school, the university and the Northeast. The dream of the art collection was, it seems, temporarily held in abeyance, while Gowing was occupied with his next ambitious project. Once the pictures from collections in Northumberland exhibition was on display, Gowing turned his attention to bring in Poussin's Seven Sacraments from their home on long-term loan at the National Gallery of Scotland to the north of England, to provide the region with, as he wrote to Lord Ellesmere, the owner of the paintings, as important an exhibition as it, as it has seen for many years. And so I'll now move on to this second two-part exhibition, which took place just five months later in November 1951. Gowing <clears throat> had mooted this idea with Ellesmere a few, few months earlier, possibly generated through his contact with Waterhouse and the Duke of Northumberland, who was Ellesmere's brother-in-law. Gowing planned for the series of second, seven sacraments to be accompanied by photographic enlargements of the appropriate drawings, alongside six works from Poussin and his school from the King's Royal Collections at Windsor. Due to the significance of Poussin to art history and the seven sacraments within the artist's body of work, Gowing was also planning a preliminary exhibition, which would run through November 1951 to introduce the works to King's College students academics and the public. This was intended to whet their appetite for the main show, which was to be supported by a first class series of lectures by various authorities that could later be published in book form. A newspaper article announcing the forthcoming exhibition 
as shown here from the Newcastle Journal and North Mail, which may have been produced by Gowing himself, demonstrates the significance of Gowing's enterprise and possibly his own publicity machine. It describes the exhibition as having achieved two records in British art history. One, that it was to be the first time in Britain that a collection of drawings owned by the King would be shown in the provinces. These were the preliminary drawings done by Poussin for the Seven Sacraments from Windsor Castle. The second was that it would be the first time the Seven Sacraments would be shown in sequence, which was not the case at the National Gallery of Scotland. Arrangements for the exhibitions included correspondence between Gowing, Ellesmere, Waterhouse, Rudolf Wittkover from the Warburg Institute, the Royal Librarian at Windsor Castle, and Anthony Blunt, the director of the King's Pictures. Blunt, as a director of the Courtauld Institute and advisor to the National Gallery, held many prestigious roles at the time. He was also an expert on Poussin, accepting Gary's request to take part in a lecture series and taking advantage of the short time he spent in Northumberland to visit the art collections in Annick Castle and Seton Delaval Hall. Previously, back in 1949, Anthony Blunt had presented a lecture on Picasso at King's College, and it is evident that by 1951, Gowing was sharing with him a mutual interest in Poussin and discussions on art and art collections. Gowing's arrangements of the two Poussin exhibitions and the supporting lectures were an overtly educational and didactic experiment planned with the aim of educating the people of the north of England about the significance of Poussin and this series of works to Western art. Gowing explained in his intentions in the Gowing explained his intentions and the innovative approach he was taking in an information sheet. He wrote, during the coming months, the Hatton Gallery will be the scene of an experiment, which is, I think, of considerable interest to all who are concerned with art and education. We have arranged two exhibitions for this period. These two exhibitions are concerned with a single painter, Nicholas Poussin and primarily only with a part of his work, the great series of the pictures of the Seven Sacraments, painted for, for the Sieur de Chanteloup. And this, the image in this slide and the following five images are all of the preliminary exhibition. And I have not yet found any images of the second exhibition of the series of the paintings of the Seven Sacraments um, in the Hatton Gallery. Gowing had organized the two exhibitions so that the first would provide the preliminary knowledge through visual and other written material to introduce people to Poussin, enable them to enjoy the intellectual depth of his work. The second and main exhibition was planned to last for three months so that people would have the time to visit and study the works closely, as art, art historians would do, giving them the attention Gowing believed they deserved. Gowing explained, Studies of this kind are usually considered to be the province of the professional art historian. We believe that they are of wider interest and that visitors to the gallery may welcome the chance to consider the history and context of pictures which offer such rich rewards. The extent to which Gowan wanted to educate and draw the visitors into Poussin's working methods and world is demonstrated by his introduction into the preliminary exhibition of a reconstruction of a model used by Poussin to assist him with his compositions. This was a box that Poussin is recorded to have created to set up the scenes in the manner of a stage set with wax figures. These he could drape and arrange and study the lighting and from which he could formulate the design of his large canvases. Going and the students built the model in the department following the descriptions given in documents that were displayed alongside translated from source texts. The model also appears to have contributed to Blunt's knowledge of his own prime subject of study, as he referred to the reconstruction and used images of it in his subsequent book on Poussin. And this slide shows a reconstructed model on the right of the picture, alongside texts and supporting images relating to representations of the sacraments, in this case the baptism, as depicted in the large photograph of the painting by the 15th century artist Piero della Francesca. 
The catalogue as an educational guide to the exhibits formed an integral part of the experience of the two exhibitions, such that for the public, access to the exhibition was through the purchase of the catalogue only, with concessions of schools and other groups whose leaders, Gang expected, would familiarise themselves with its content before the visit. Gowing, it seems, was aiming to encourage an approach to art similar to that of the Warburg scholars whom he so admired. And this is also evident through the way the content of the exhibition was displayed and so the support of the Warburg Institute in its making, whose help was acknowledged by Gowing in the catalogue. Through the, photographic, through the photographic displays, contemporary accounts and reconstructed models of the artist's methods and practice, Gowing wanted to educate students, visitors, and no doubt himself about how old masters created their masterworks. By looking deeper into and learning more about an artwork through an understanding of its cultural, social, and psychological context and the artist's practice, he hoped to prepare people to be confronted by a series of artworks in which they could indulge themselves beyond the cursory glance and with a deeper understanding of the artist's intent and the work's execution. It should also be pointed out, and Gowing acknowledged this, that the exhibition, so dependent on photography, would not have been possible without the technological support of the King's College Phot Photography Department, which predominantly served the medical school, but which Gowing engaged with to photograph and document the Poussin exhibition. I would like to propose that parallels can be made between the scene, this scene of an experiment and Richard Hamilton's exhibition, Man, Machine in Motion, 1955, an exhibition of which Gowing was a significant facilitator, which Hamilton also described as didactic. Man, Machine in Motion, while more innovatively displayed on modern industrial materials, also comprised displays of enlarged photographs. In addition, a catalogue produced by Hamilton, Rainer Bannum, Rainer Bannum and Gowing with its introduction and supporting explanatory text for each exhibit, though more sophisticated in design and its use of typography in images, I would suggest has close conceptual parallels to the Poussin catalogue. And this image, is, image shows pages from the Poussin catalogue to the left alongside of the some pages from the Man, Machine and Motion catalogue. The catalogue's inclusion and integral role in the exhibition, which gave context and scholarly weight to the images displayed, may also have been, in some part, driven by Gowing's initial concerns over the novel content and format of Hamilton's exhibition and how it might be received within the norms of the traditional art gallery display format and the expectation of the gallery visitors. I also wish to propose that Gowing's drive to undertake an in-depth study of how Poussin conceived, developed and constructed an artwork to the extent of carefully reconstructing an aspect of his work from primary texts resonated into the next decade with Hamilton's reconstruction in the Fine Art Department in 1965 to 1966 of Marcel Duchamp's The Bride Stripped Bear by Her Bachelor's Even also known as the Large Glass, made between 1915 and 1923. When the Tate Gallery planned its Duchamp retrospective for 1966, but without the inclusion of his fragile original Large Glass, Hamilton undertook to study Duchamp's construction, working methods, notes, and supporting text to reconstruct a version. Hamilton explained in a newspaper article which is shown here alongside the poster for the subsequent exhibition of the work in the Hatton Gallery, that he undertook the project so that the British public would not be denied the chance to experience the glass. Hamilton's project was also therefore an in-depth study of an artist's seminal artwork. It was also considered valuable research befitting a university department and was closely engaged with by the students. Just as for the exhibitions, Man, Machine and Motion, and an exhibit in the previous decade, the Hatton Gallery was the scene 
of an experiment in the unveiling of Hamilton's project, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelor's Eden, again. In this instance, prior to its journey to London for display at the Tate. This talk, I hope, therefore demonstrates that it was Gowing who first introduced the Hatton Gallery as the scene of an experiment, and which facilitated significant aspects of early post-war art scholarship, connoisseurship, art collecting, and art market, market exchanges, but which also led to the much more widely acknowledged experimentation and innovation which took place in the Fine Art Department of King's College later in the 1950s, 1960s. Going may not have predicted the outcome of the combination of Hamilton and Passmore's joint quests and individual pursuits in analyzing the roots of creative practice through image and exhibition making, but he had laid the groundwork for a regime of inquiry and curiosity which fostered them. This ethos of research and experiment was to manifest itself in Hamilton's exhibition, Man, Machine and Motion, and his reconstruction of Marcel Duchamp's The Large Glass. It was also expressed through Hamilton and Passmore's collaboration on the innovative installation and exhibit and their development of experimental ways of teaching art through the basic course. And so I would like to conclude by proposing that Gowing's two ambitious exhibition projects which I have discussed here, could therefore be seen as important signifiers for the future development of the Hatton Gallery's dual role in the Fine Art Department and in King's College. As a place where the boundaries of art practice, exhibition making and art education were explored and tested. The, exhibition, the two exhibitions focusing on Poussin, the seven sacraments on the one hand, could be seen as a precursor to Hamilton's inquiry into Duchamp's work and Hamilton and Passmore's use of the Hatton Gallery for exploratory and experimental exhibitions, which engaged people in new ways of thinking about art and exhibitions. Pictures from collections in Northumberland, on the other hand, could be seen as providing the momentum for the creation of a significant collection of artworks intended to engage and inspire both the students and the public in an understanding and appreciation of art. I would like to close this talk by thanking all the institutions and individuals who supported and assisted my research. And to thank you to listening to some of the results of this research that I've set out here in the Hatton Gallery will be the theme of an experiment. And finally, I'd like to show again one of those works that Gary purchased in 1952 for the Hampton Gallery. And alongside it, a quote from one of Gary's notebook essays on the powerful agency of a work of art, which I think this work exemplifies. Gary wrote, it enfolds us, it subjects us to its scrutiny and swallows or rejects. Thank you.